Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope the week's gone well. We've finally got some sunshine here in Nairobi, which is pleasant because we've had a real cold spell. Highly unusual for this month of the year. Macro thoughts, uh, the European uh, Central Bank cut its deposit rate to minus 0.5% from minus 0.4% and introduced quantitative easing from November the 1st at 20 billion euros per month and changed its guidance. And my goodness, what an extraordinary reversal we witnessed in the euro dollar, which fell all the way to 109.26 and then turned around and we're currently at 110.96, a really extraordinary move. Um, Bovell underscore GM tweeted at that time it was 160 pip rally in the euro dollar masks the absolutely dire economic outlook for the Eurozone monetary policy has been rendered impotent, they tweeted, and saying that the pair should break back below 109.26 and free fall thereafter. And I stay with that view, but really, I think uh, they have burned a lot of Euro shorts, which actually makes the down move more likely at a future date. Uh, Srini Sivabalan says the growing negative correlation between the euro and emerging market currencies suggests the ECB stimulus is a gold-plated invitation to carry traders, which is what I'm sure a lot of people thought first thing, but then certainly were disavowed of the notion as the euro then squeezed higher. Now, let's move to America. U.S. core consumer prices, ex-food and energy, were up by 2.24% in the three months June to August, compared with a year ago. That's from J. Kemp Energy. Core consumer prices were up 2.39% uh, in August, the fastest year-on-year -year increase since September 2008, which goes back to something I've been talking about several in July, I said specifically with respect to the US, stoking up the fire with rate cuts is a very dangerous situation because the Federal Reserve will need to be raising rates into the election, something that will turn President Trump apoplectic, I am sure. This is the biggest jump in core consumer inflation since September 28, that's from Trading Economics. And that's why I said on the 1st of July, if I were back at my desk at Credit Suisse, I would be limited short to the euro dollar market, uh, the interest rate market. Um, and I said, reality will soon intrude on this reality show. And I think essentially the, uh, the data that's coming out, the inflation data, is, means that we're at that moment when reality is intruding. 24th of June, I said we are in nosebleed territory. This is voodoo economics. And just because we have not reached the point when the curtain was lifted in the Wizard of Oz and the wizard was revealed to be an ordinary con man from Omaha who had been using elaborate magic tricks and props to make himself seem great and powerful, should not lull us into a false sense of security. And on the 3rd of June, I said, well, I accept that it's a 2080, this tariff war, the US consumer is absorbing 20%, China is absorbing 80% of the tariff increase. Nevertheless, 20% of 100 is inflationary. And I think we're seeing that inflation now feed into the US system. I also said that markets can stay irrational longer than anyone can stay solvent. Um, and that's a fair point as well. This is from Svensson Anders, strong US core CPI momentum. Look at the momentum in the last three months as well. I take you back to December 2018 when I said, he, when I was quoting a chap called Murphy who was telling the Washington Post he's trapped 
He's playing poker, holding two threes and suddenly putting all of his chips in. It's pure emotion, the mark of a panicking amateur. And then yesterday we saw this, M. Nicoletos tweeted, first Trump advisers considering interim China deal to delay tariffs, then breaking senior administration official tells CNBC that the White House is absolutely not considering an interim deal. And the quote from Nicol Nicoletos was, this is ridiculous, which it is. The direction of the dollar therefore remains pivotal, as I wrote at the end of last year, and I was looking for the dollar to strengthen about 10% uh, through 2019. And I was saying if the US economy slows, I can guarantee you the rest of the world will slow further, and I think essentially that's what we're seeing. Home thoughts. Few hotel lobbies <coughs> in the modern world had a legacy as rich as that of the Okuro in Tokyo. It was torn down and now it's back. The first business trip I ever went on was to New York for Credit Suisse Plus Boston and I stayed in the St. Regis. And actually this tweet from the St. Regis New York, the most exclusive table in New York City, Table 55, I don't think I sat at that table, but I certainly sat in that restaurant and brought back some very fond memories of a very distant past. A stunning view of a sunrise over the Maasai Mara, four hot air balloons float quietly, each filled with observers full of awe. The asymmetrical distribution of the balloons add depth to the image, indeed it did. A serene sunrise. This is the Mombasa Nairobi Highway back in the day. That photograph is from K Researcher. I wrote a story about that January 2013 on the road, which was about the Nairobi Mombasa uh, Road. The Nairobi Mombasa Road arrows into immensities and is impossible to believe. It retains a near mystical hold on my imagination and connects me to my childhood and beyond. Dad used to once own an Alfa Romeo, of which there were then only three in the country, and my pilgrimage along that road started then when we used to come from Mombasa up to Nairobi. Now we've stopped driving, but we did a few times from Nairobi down to Mombasa, and the landmarks still reach out to me. We were swarmed last time we drove by doves near Imali, which was breathtaking. There is still the eerie and deserted, very Oscar Niemeyer building, which might have been a petrol station with a restaurant. We stopped at Makindu, which is like being transported to Amritsa, and on New Year's Day was packed to the rafters. We always stop at Mackinnon Road where there is a shrine which houses the tomb of Said Bagali, a Punjabi foreman at the time of the building of the railway, who was renowned for his strength. And once when we were very young, I remember counting a herd of more than 500 elephants crossing the road, unlikely to ever see that again. It is so much simpler to bury reality than it is to dispose of dreams, Don DeLillo, Americana. In Libra, Don DeLillo, there is a world inside the world. I came across an interesting article in Nomad Capitalist, 15 countries with no income taxes. In fact, Alaska apparently even shares its oil money with its residents through a permanent fund. A family of four living in the state receives roughly $20,000 per year. Political reflections, he wanted nothing to do with John Bolton, Trump says of Kim Jong-un as part of a long explanation of his ouster. I thought to myself, that's truly a mind-boggling comment from a US president. We then learned that the Taliban were tweeting Trump. Have a look at this tweet uh, from Laura Walker KC. In this photograph, uh, Iraq's Moqtada al-Sadr 
is seen with the IRGC's Al-Quds leader Qasem Soleimani and Iran's Ali Khamenei celebrating Ashura together. And it speaks to the deep connection between 60% of the population in Iraq who are Shia and Iran. And that's, what, that's why when Bush was talking about bringing democracy to Iraq, it seemed he was not able to realize that if he did that, he was going to put the Shia into power, something which American foreign policy has sought to, 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 to not allow all this time. Very interesting article. Again, this is Whitney Webb, who's written a series of great articles in Mint Press News. In this article, she's saying more Americans questioning the official 9-11 story as new evidence contradicts the official narrative. Uh, today, the event that defined the United States foreign policy in the 21st century and heralded the destruction of whole countries turns 18. The events of September 11 remains etched into the memories of Americans and many others as a collective tragedy that brought Americans together and brought as well a general resolve among them that those responsible be brought to justice. However, American corporate media has remained largely silent, preferring to ignore new developments that could derail the official story of one of the most iconic and devastating attacks to ever occur on American soil. On July 24th, the Board of Commissioners for the Franklin Square and Munson Fire District, which serves a population of around 30,000 near Queens, voted unanimously in their call for a new investigation into the attacks. Overwhelming evidence presented in said petition demonstrates beyond any doubt that pre-planted explosives and or incendiaries, not just airplanes and the ensuing fires, caused the destruction of the three World Trade Center buildings, killing the vast majority of the victims who perished that day. This has been known from the very beginning. And this is what I find amazing about the world. There is a world inside the world in that this narrative was never challenged. In the prima facie, it was obvious. Uh, we're a tight-knit community and we never forget our fallen brothers and sisters. You better believe that when the entire fire service of New York State is on board, we will be an unstoppable force. We were the first fire district to pass this resolution. We won't be the last, he added. While most Americans know full well that the Twin Towers collapsed on September 11, fewer are aware that a third building, the World Trade Center Building 7, also collapsed. That collapse occurred seven hours after the Twin Towers came down, even though WTC 7, or Building 7, was never struck by a plane. It, wasn't, it was not until nearly two months after its collapse that reports revealed that the CIA had a secret office in WTC7 and that after the building's destruction, special CIA teams scoured the rubble in search of secret documents and intelligence reports stored in the station, either on paper or in computers. A poll found that 52% of those who saw the footage were either sure or suspected that the building's fall was due to explosives and was a controlled demolition, with 27% saying they didn't know what to make of the footage. The Americans who felt the video footage of WTC7's collapse did not fit with the official narrative and appeared to show a controlled demolition now have more scientific evidence to fall back on after the release of a new university study found that the building came down not due to fire, but from the near simultaneous failure of every column in the building. The study, authored by Dr. J. Leroy Halsey, Dr. Feng Xiao, and Dr. Zili Quan, found that the fire did not cause the collapse of WTC-7 on 9-11, contrary to the conclusions of the National Institute of Standards and Technology and private engineering firms, 
studied the collapse, whilst also concluding that the collapse of WTC7 was a global, i.e. comprehensive failure involving the near simultaneous failure of every column in the building. Jennings told a reporter the day of the attack that he and Michael Hess, then Corporation Counsel for New York City, had heard and seen explosions in WTC7 several hours prior to its collapse and later repeated those claims to filmmaker Dylan Avery. Um, to Dylan Avery, the first responders who helped rescue Jennings and Hess also claimed to have heard explosions in WTC7. Jennings died in 2008, two days prior to the release of the official NIST report blaming WTC7's collapse on fires. To date, no official cause of death for Jennings has been given. 18 years after the September 11 attacks, questioning the official government narrative of the events of those days still remains taboo for many years, merely asking questions or calling for a new investigation into one of the most important events in recent American history frequently results in derision and dismissal. Evidence continues to mount that the official narrative itself is the irrational narrative. It becomes ever more clear that the reason for this media campaign is to prevent legitimate questions about that day from receiving the scrutiny they deserve, even smearing victims' families and ailing first responders to do so. For too long, never forget has been nearly synonymous with never question took me back to Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, in which he said if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. Twin Buddhas, Twin Towers, interesting coincidence. So what, Thomas Pynchon, Bleeding Edge? You remember those twin statues of the Buddha that I told you about, carved out of a mountain in Afghanistan? that got dynamited by the Taliban back in the spring. Notice anything familiar? Twin Buddhas, twin towers, interesting coincidence. So what? The Trade Center towers were religious too. They stood for what this country worships about. Above everything else, the market, always the holy market. A religious beef, you're saying? It's not a religion. These are people who believe the invisible hand of the market runs everything. They fight holy wars against competing religions like Marxism. Against all evidence that the world is finite, this blind faith that resources will never run out, profits will go on increasing forever, just like the world's populations, more cheap labor, more addicted consumers. This is the Buddhas of Bamiyan, two 6th century monumental statues of Gautama Buddha carved into the side of a cliff in the Bamiyan Valley in the Hazara Jat region of central Afghanistan. Again, Thomas Pynchon, The Bleeding Edge, no matter how the official narrative of this turns out, it seemed to Heidi, these are the places we should be looking not in newspapers or television, but at the margins, graffiti, uncontrolled utterances, bad dreamers who sleep in public and scream in their sleep. Don DeLillo in Libra, facts are lonely things. There's always more to it. This is what history consists of. It is the sum total of the things they aren't telling us. <coughs> In societies reduced to blur and glut, terror is the only meaningful act. <clears throat> you live in a tower that soars to heaven and goes unpunished by God, Don DeLillo. Temporal bandwidth is the width of your present, your now. It is the familiar ATT considered as a dependent variable. The more you dwell in the past and in the future, the thicker your bandwidth, the more solid your persona, but the narrower your sense of now, 
the more tenuous you are. So, lots to think about, and I still go back to Thomas Pinch and the Bleeding Edge, and I still find this is like George F. K. Kennedy, uh, when he was shot and the explanation given was patently false. And a similar thing with 9-11. Just in Hong Kong government plans to cancel this year's National Day fireworks show on October the 1st. Um, as I said, in August it is not possible to zinyak Hong Kong, I think. When the system does not provide, we take things in our own hands. Pop singer Denise Ho says Hong Kong protesters have demonstrated their unity to the world. And then I came across a super article of the FT, Fear and Oppression in Xinjiang, China's War on Uyghur Culture, Beijing's Crackdown on Minorities, reflects a broader push towards a single state race. We're seeing that in India, in Kashmir. We're seeing that in so many different places. Uh, scholars of the region argue that China's Communist Party is attempting to re-engineer minority society to make Uyghurs and other Muslims in Xinjiang ever more like the Han Chinese majority. For the campaign to fit the definition of cultural genocide, it would need to be a premeditated, systematic effort orchestrated by the state, James Leibolt, an expert on China's ethnic policy at La Trobe University in Melbourne. I think it's important that we start to call it what it is. Re-engineering, rewiring, remoulding, all work, but the evidence suggests that cultural genocide fits. China's Qing dynasty claimed the region as its new frontier, which is the literal translation of Xinjiang, in the 18th century, following a series of bloody military campaigns that wiped out the local Tibetan Mongol Zungo rulers. For a Yuga intellectual, a Yuga writer living in Xinjiang, writing about politics as suicide, um, then talking about a professor from Tsinghua University called Hu Angang, uh, Hu Lianhe suggested that attempts to promote multi-ethnic states elsewhere in the world had failed and China should push different ethnicities to blend together into a single state race, which is the strategy here. After 2009, there's a growing chorus of scholars and officials who say China is in danger of losing its grip over Tibet and Xinjiang and needs a radical reset of its ethnic policies, says Leibold. Among the loudest voices calling for a new generation of ethnic policies was Hu Lian A. China should push different ethnicities to blend together into a single state race. Any nation's long-term peace and stability is founded upon building a system with a unified race that strengthens the state race identity and dilutes ethnic group identity, the two wrote in a 2012 paper. That year, Z formally launched the People's War on Terror and vowed to strike hard against the three evil forces of separatism, terrorism, and religious extremism in Xinjiang. Libel sees the most recent camp system in Xinjiang as a direct descendant of the former. The system evolves and changes through time, but I do think it's part of the party's DNA, this desire to transform. Language is the main difference between Han and Uyghurs. It's the core element of Uyghur identity. Um, and then the Yuga mother tongue movement was seen as the fourth evil force alongside those of separatism, religious extremism and terrorism. For me, the words in their mouths are not very stable, just like a raindrop on a rose. When there is a gust of wind, it will disappear. Mass internment program has left many minority children without their parents. Authorities have built a network of de facto orphanages and boarding schools that can hothouse the children in Han Chinese environments. Chinese state created a vast, multi-layered care system that enables it to provide full-time, 
or near full-time care for children from as young as one or two years of age. The facilities were likely to be part of a deliberate strategy and crucial element in the state's systematic campaign of social re-engineering and cultural genocide in Xinjiang. This is Zents. It's a very sad story. This is a photograph of Chen Quang Ho, who has been waging President Xi's People's War on Terror in Xinjiang since he took office in 2016. He rolled, he rolled out similar hardline security measures in his previous role in Tibet. This is Beram Yam Muhammad, uh, shown here playing the dutar, a traditional Yuga musical instrument. Satellite photography has been vital in exposing the existence and scale of the detention camps. In March 2017, this site marked with the yellow pin is empty. Then in this satellite photograph, the detention camp is almost complete. The old town of Kashgar, shown here in 2017, is the traditional capital of Yuga culture. Many of its bookshops are shuttered now. When asked what Yuga literature or history books he had, one owner replied, we only sell novels, cookery, or self-help books. March 2018, I said China has unveiled the digital panopticon in Xinjiang, and today we're seeing that being unveiled in Kashmir, in Gaza, and all kinds of places. Dissent is measured, I wrote, and snuffed out very quickly in China. China has unveiled a digital panopticon in Xinjiang where a combination of data from video surveillance, face and license plate recognition, mobile device locations, and official records to identify targets for detention. Xinjiang is surely a precursor for how the CCCP will manage dissent. The actions in Xinjiang are part of regional authorities' ongoing strike hard campaign and of President Xi's stability maintenance and enduring peace drive in the region. As I wrote recently, the frontier from Xinjiang to Kashmir, from Gaza to Crimea, from Hong Kong to Taiwan, are 21st century flashpoints. Have a look at this, Steve Bannon's warning on China trade war. This is an interview with Kyle Bass. Uh, 26th of August, I spoke about how China had struck back at Trump. I was saying that Xi is controlling the console through the movement of the Chinese renminbi. Um, and previously I'd asked who blinks first on the 9th of July last year. We'll keep an eye on that. International markets, the point when the curtain was lifted at the Wizard of Oz and the wizard revealed to be an ordinary con man from Omaha who has been using elaborate magic tricks and props to make himself seem great and powerful. And just like that, the yield on the 10-year U.S. government bond trades above 1.8%, nearly a 40 basis point increase in just under two weeks. The EU fears Boris Johnson is plotting to persuade Hungary to veto a Brexit delay. That took me back to Baldrick's cunning plan. That link is on Rich Wrap Up. So let's move on to the currency markets. Oh my God. 110.95, enormous turnaround in the euro that I expected to peter out around here. Dollar index below 98. Japanese yen 108.03. Swiss franc 0.9875. The pound 124.44. Bang on resistance. The Aussie, let's see where that is now. 0.6875, India rupee 70.87. The emerging market currencies have rallied. South Korean won 1176 Brazilian real 40604. So still to get below four. Egyptian pound 16.42, South African around 14.57. Dollar index is a buy now um, on this re retracement. Uh, there's 15 countries with no income taxes, uh, no net capitalist in Singapore. You only need to pay tax on locally generated income. Gold, well, that's been up and down. We're currently at 15.05. Crude oil, $54.72. Emerging markets, Turkey Central Bank cut its target rate to 16.5%, down from 19.75%. 
uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa Confidential, the China Price, very interesting article, Facing Corruption Probes and Resource Nationalism, Western Mining Companies Are Quitting the Copper Belt, Producing 70% of the World's Cobalt, an Essential Component of Electric Car Batteries and Mobile Phones, Africa's Copper Belt is in the midst of a sweeping transformation seeking to expand their access to the metal. China's mining companies are eyeing the potential sale of assets such as Vedanta's Concola copper mines in Zambia, Glencore's mothballed Mutanda mine in Congo, Kinshasa. Fits in with a shift in China's strategy in Africa to focus more on private companies' operations rather than state-backed mega-projects as set out by Yang Jiechi, President Xi Jinping's Africa envoy, on recent trips to Kenya and Nigeria. Another complication is the growing scrutiny of international oil and mining companies. Glencore, one of the biggest commodity trading and production companies, faces a raft of corruption investigations. Rising demand for cobalt, lithium, nickel and rare earths is changing mining companies on both sides of the border between Congo, Kinshasa and Zambia. It comes amid speculation in the markets that Glencore facing a US Department of Justice investigation into corruption in four countries including Congo K is looking for an exit. Mutanda holds the world's largest known cobalt deposits produced a fifth of global supplies of the metal for the batteries of electric vehicles. Turning to Lungu's debts, Zambia has long had Chinese mining companies, small and medium-scale operators in its co copper belt. President Lungu's government has racked up much bigger debts to Chinese companies than it had previously admitted. Sources in the finance ministry in Lusaka say that Chinese creditors are losing patience over debt arrears. Chinese companies are not keen on debt rescheduling and would prefer to get some collateral, perhaps in the form of other mining assets. Under growing political pressure, as economic problems mount, President Lungu is running out of options. Chinese companies would seek to benefit from the liquidation of Vedanta's Concola copper mines, also watching First Quantum Minerals, the country's largest producer, which operates Kanshansi and Sentinel mines. <clears throat> Glencore Zambian mine Mopani may also be ready for the auction block. Some industry insiders say Glencore's two majority owned Congo K companies, Mutanda and Toronto, listed Katanga Mining, which operates the Kamoto Copper Project, are also being prepared for sale. Glencore's threatened mine closure may strengthen its hand with the government in its bid for an exemption to the 10% strategic substance levy on cobalt and the super profits tax in the mining code. Congo, Kinshasa's tax revenues will plummet if Mutanda closes. Glencore paid the government $626 million in taxes from Mutanda in 2018. Kabila and his allies still call the shots in the mining industry. Albert Yuma, Mulimbi, Kabila's man and the architect of the mining code, has just had his contract renewed as chairman of Gekamine, the state-owned mining firm. In February, I did not know this, a truck carrying sulfuric acid to Mutanda crashed into a minibus and spilled acid on the road, leaving at least 22 people dead a month later. 43 artisanal miners were killed at Kamoto and the army was sent in to restore order. At the heart of Glencore's problems in Congo, Kinshasa, is the fact that its assets were acquired with the assistance of the Israeli businessman Dan Gertler, who was placed on a US sanctions list in December 2017. Gertler had used his close relationship with Kabila to act as a middleman for mining asset sales in the DRC, requiring some multinational companies to go through Gertler to do business with the Congolese state. As a result of Gertler's actions, the Treasury said between 2010 and 2012 alone, the Kong country, Kinshasa, one of the world's poorest countries, may have lost more than $1.3 billion in revenues from the underpricing of mining assets that were sold to offshore companies linked to Gertler. 
The sanctioning of Gertler created problems for Glencore as it owed him around $200 million in royalties. Paying him those royalties would put them in violation of US sanctions, so the account was frozen. After a political battle in Congo, Kinshasa, and a legal battle in Europe, Glencore resumed its royalty payments to Gertler in euros rather than US dollars to circumvent the sanctions. It said this was the only way to retain control of its assets in Congo, Kinshasa. So, a lot going on in there. There's a photograph I'm posting of Dan Gertler in the Congo, which I took. San Marino seizes $19 million from Congo dictator Dennis Sassu Gueso, who spent $100,000 on crocodile sheens. But have a look at this from Sadiq Shaban. This is the Congo president Sassu Nguesso arriving for a national event. Uh, it's interesting that San Marino, uh, the seized money will go into San Marino's coffers, they pronounced. Robert Gabriel Mugabe, as I said, 1924 to 2019, um, Africa Confidential saying the death of Robert Mugabe means little to the majority of Zimbabweans, not only are most too young to be aware of the liberation war and the dawn of black majority rule in 1980, but the prostrate economy demands all their attention. Which takes me back to something I wrote, quoting Jonathan Moyo, meanwhile the people forgot the vision of the liberation struggle. The people were saying, what good is liberation without food? In fact, Sick transit Gloria Mundi. Death is final. It places even the most powerful men permanently on their backs. Don Sarigo. In 2019, we see new downside risks in sub Saharan Africa. That's Razia Khan. Um, and this goes to the feedback loop phenomenon. We can call it the China Asia emerging market and frontier markets feedback loop. This feedback loop has been largely a positive one for the last two decades, with the renminbi now in retreat and in a precise response to Trump. This will surely exert serious downside pressure on those countries in the feedback loop. Of increasing focus is Sub-Saharan Africa's growing indebtedness to China. Again, this is from Razia Khan. It is important to note that the debt profile remains an important differentiator. <coughs> And as I said on 29th of July, from an economic perspective, balance sheets are fully loaded and the exposure to foreign markets quite high. Mukisa Kitui, the Inter-African Trade Agreement, presents an enormous opportunity to transform Africa into the next global growth engine. 46% of traded goods within Africa is value added while only 6% of goods exported out of Africa is value added. I think the AFCTA is a silver bullet, particularly if we allow the free circulation of our people. Of course, the devil is in the detail um, of the execution, and such things can simply fall apart in a deluge of non-tariff barriers, but it is a silver bullet, particularly if we allow the free circulation of our people. Howard French has written about uh, the uh, Afrophobia in South Africa. He cites a front page headline which read, Killed for being African. The turn in South Africa's mood against other Africans is more than that. He says it's a catastrophic failure. Education system, surely a central pillar of economic advancement. A recent survey showed that 27% of South African students who complete six years of school still cannot read compared to 4% in Tanzania. Only 37% of South African students start school past the matric exam. In 1994, when Mandela became president, China's per capita GDP was a mere $473. South Africa's was more than seven times higher at 3,445. China's wager on Africa has paid off stunningly well, he says. <coughs> of course, Howard was a great uh, guest at mine speak earlier this year. Here you see President Kronzinza receiving uh, Dr. Peter Fan, the special envoy of the US to the Great Lakes region. Um, here, President uh, 
Corinne Zinze is a Pentecostal former aerobics instructor and rebel leader with his own presidential soccer team called Hallelujah FC. Might well that tracksuit might well be the Hallelujah FC tracksuit. South African oil shares up 7.67% year to date, dollar rand at 14.54, Egyptian pound at 16.41, EGX 30 up 15.91% year to date, Nigerian oil share down 12.74% year to date, Ghana Stock Exchange down 9.71% year to date. According to this nomad capitalist, Somalia has no income tax, in part because of its status as a failed state. The cuts will be brutal and will be sustained. This is Ukru Yatani, the Treasury Secretary here in Kenya, told a meeting. Uh, Kenya will cut unnecessary expenditures such as trips abroad by officials and advertising by government departments to rein in a gaping fiscal deficit, acting finance minister said on Thursday. Projects worth 396.9 billion shillings in Kenya have stalled as of June 2018. Government has stopped dispersing funds. Government will shrink delegations, spending on printing, advertising, and office supplies. Let's see if they can follow through on that. At least the Belosi is getting ahead of this before it got ahead of him. This uh, look at this cartoon from I Gaida. Evangelists now showing at a screen near you. He really is a very pertinent observer of society. Credit growth may be too weak to sustain future activity. Razia Khan, value of mobile money payments rose by 11.1% to 2.5 trillion in the first seven months of this uh, year, new data from the central bank shows. Kenya shilling at 103.80, Nairobi all shares up 2.53% year to date, NSE 20 is down 13.83% year to date. Thank you for stopping by.